They are punched, kicked. They are beaten while trying to hold on to their babies. They are strangled, choked, burned with cigarettes, doused with kerosene and lighter fluid and set on fire. They are run over by cars and trucks. They have their teeth knocked out with hammers. They are stabbed with everything from knives to ice picks to screwdrivers, anything that penetrates. Their children are forced to watch their assaults and torture, and they are often tied up and forced to watch the torture and molestation of their own children. Am I describing atrocities committed in some foreign country by enemy soldiers in a country at war? Am I describing atrocities about which Amnesty International and other human rights organizations are writing to you and pleading for money? I'm describing domestic violence as it occurs in America. Yes, there is a war against women and children in this country. First, January 7th. Lana Gilbert, 45 years old, of, Sim of Somerville, Mass., was slain by her boyfriend of 15 years. Then again, on February 13th, Regina McGee, 20 years old, was fatally shot, allegedly by her boyfriend, Joseph Smith, 23, in the Dorchester home of Smith's mother. Then again, March 21st, Julie Harlow, 22, of Whitman, died of a gunshot wound to the chest, arms, and legs. Again, on April 19th, Mary Ann Mortel of Springfield was stabbed to death. Her husband, Michael Mortel, is scheduled to be tried for the murder on December 6th. Again, May 1st, Cynthia Reed, 22, of Peabody, was found dead, stabbed more than 40 times in the front seat of her car at Logan Airport. Her former boyfriend, Wayne, 22, has been charged with her murder. I met Brian when I was 11 years old. We started dating when I was 16, and when I was 18, we got married. After we got married, everything changed. He became a completely different person. And um, for 10 long years, he abused me um, sexually, physically, emotionally. My batter's name is Jose. I met him in 1987. And as our relationship started out, it was nice. For like about six months, the relationship was fine until one day we was at the gallery, which is a club in Boston, came home from the gallery, and that's when the abuse started. Um, he socked me in my face, I had a black eye, and from that day on, the abuse became frantic. I met Alfred one day, I was working, I worked for the Mass Bay Transportation Authority in Massachusetts. I, um, was driving, um, it's a bus route that you drive throughout the local cities. I wanted to try to do something in my life. And um, when I got the job, life was good, but it was, it was a very strenuous job. And when, when I met him, it was just like the answer. He was polite, uh, he opened doors for me. Um, he catered to me, he waited on me. Uh, it was just so sweet. I knew that it was a lot of put on too because we had just gotten together. With Tommy, it was fine in the beginning. Then he started being obsessive and jealous and then accusing me and one time he I was on the I was standing in front of the bed and I think and he threw me down on the bed and started ripping my uniform off me and uh, slapping me in the face and as he was tearing my uniform off me he started to rape me and I didn't want to have sex with him and he was just taking it and uh, he turned me over and he sodomized me and after he got done with me I really couldn't move. 
It has been 15 years now since I found myself a battered woman on welfare at a time when there were no abuse prevention laws, no shelters, DAs, judges, police that I could find. They were all concerned about my safety, the safety of my then infant son and the two foster children I had. Well, we've come a little ways in 15 years. There are now 1,200 battered women's shelters across this country. But you need to keep that in perspective. There are about 3,800 animal protection shelters. No matter how much you love animals, it seems to me our priorities are a little skewed when we have three times the number of shelters for homeless animals than we have for battered women and their children. The Center for Disease Control has even come to understand that domestic violence constitutes the number one cause of injury to women in America. Women are in nine times more danger in their own home than they are in the street. The FBI tells us one out of every two women will be in a violent relationship in their lifetime, not because 50% of all men are batterers, but because we as their community and society completely fail to hold them accountable. They are free to move on to the next victim. May 28th, Sandra Clinton was strangled while her two children watched. Her former boyfriend, Frederick Murphy, 27, has been charged with the murder and attempted murder. The police say Murphy attempted to strangle another former girlfriend the same day. He would beat me with billy clubs, uh, any type of object that he could put his hands on, he would beat me with. And it didn't matter where it was, he would beat me. So I never thought of turning him in because from my background, I come from an abusive background. I've always thought it was okay for me to accept this type of abuse you know, as a child. He just became very violent all the time, slapping me, pushing me, calling me names. I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. I guess, you know, now I realize that, you know, at that time you try to, you feel like it's you, something you're doing to provoke his behavior. So you try to do everything right you end up staying because you really want to believe that the person you love loves you back. Every person, human being, needs to believe that they're loved and, and needed. And um, because you hate what they're doing, it doesn't mean you hate them. Um, and you believe they'll change. I didn't realize at the time he was tracking me. So when he showed up, he says, well, can I go to work with you? I says, no. I said, look what you just did to me this morning. Look what you just did to me last night. I said, all this violence that everywhere we go, and we're making a big scene everywhere we go. I said, look, I thought it was we. You know, I know now that it was not we, it was him. He would use objects on me. Inside me. One time, I think I was about six months pregnant, and he threw me down on the bed and we had been arguing and he said he was going to cut the baby out of my stomach because he just wanted to do it. And I really felt that he was going to do this to the baby and I was very scared. On July 15th, Genevieve Adelson 39, of Rosendale, died two days after she was beaten. She was beat to death. Her boyfriend, Jean, 42, is charged with her murder. July the 20th, Teresa Cole, 20 years old, of Danvers, was stabbed to death with a steak knife while her two, two-year-old son watched. Her boyfriend, 36 years old, he's charged with her murder. Right after I gave birth, I was never so happy in my life. I mean, that kid was my life. He's everything to me. And um, Brian never took care of him. He never bought a t-shirt for the kid. He never bought him a diaper. He never paid any attention to him. All's, when he did pay any attention to him, he would just hit him in the head. He used to like to hit him in the head all the time, and I would go off the deep end. I, you know, do whatever. At that point, my attitude was, do whatever you want to me, but don't touch my kid. I was going to leave and run to my mother's. My mother lived like three streets away. 
So I wrapped Timmy up in blankets and Brian came in the room and he hit Timmy out of my hands and Timmy bounced in the crib and he put a cigarette butt out on my neck and started pulling my hair and spitting on me. Started kicking me and I somehow managed to grab Timmy and run out of the house and I was running to my mother's and um, he hopped in his van and he started chasing me down and he took the van and he just floored it and came right towards me and I just leaned up against the fence with Timmy in my arms and I thought I was dead I thought that was it I was gonna die this is it he's finally gonna kill me like he says he's gonna and he got stuck on a stump so I just gathered myself together and I ran, kept running to my mother's house and I finally got up the driveway and he was right behind me. And I got in the house and I shut the door and I just slid down the door and my mother was standing in the kitchen. She started screaming because I guess there was blood all over the um, wall, all over the door and I never went back after that. That was the last night um, when it came to, he almost killed my son too. Yeah, I just couldn't deal with that. For the next seven years, it was a constant, everyday struggle to keep him away from me. It is a myth that we do not leave. We generally leave many times before we're finally able to leave and stay away. At first, when I left and went back, it was because he said he was sorry and it would never happen again. And then it was because I would leave the first time after that I left, I got a job in a shoe factory. By the time you've paid your rent and daycare, there's no money to eat. When I talk about fear, one of the stories that I will share with you that I hope I will never forget is having left New York gone to a small rural town in New Hampshire where I thought I would be safe. And I was in a laundromat on a Saturday morning. My son was playing around. There were people over by the cash registers. And my husband walked in the door. And I yelled over for the people to call the police. But he said, no, this is my wife. We've just had a little fight. Nobody needs to do anything. And I still had bruises on the side of my face. I said, no, this is the person who beat me up. You need to call the police. But he said, no, this is my wife. We've just had a little fight. I've come to pick her up and take her home. So nobody moved. And I thought, as long as I live, I want to remember what it feels like to be terrified for my life, and nobody can even pick up the phone. Do you know how many battered women tell me about assaults in front of their building, out in public, or in apartments with thin walls, or in summer with the windows and doors open? And nobody can be bothered to call the police. The beatings became worse. He would throw me down the stairs, stomp on me with his foot. He would um, beat me up in front of his friends to impress his friends. It was to the point where I was hospitalized several times. Right before I did leave him, one time he had beat me so bad I had a broken nose, a fractured nose. I called the police. The police came and he was standing in the doorway and I was in the driveway covered in blood and I said, I want him arrested. And they says, well, we didn't see him do it. We can't arrest him. And I'm like, well, what do you think I did this to myself? And he was laughing. Um, after the police left, I got a worse beating. They get it, it, it makes them worse when the cops show up and they tell you, we, we can't help you. Then they get mad. Oh, you're going to call the police on me? Oh, okay, fine. I'll kill you now. When I told him that he couldn't ride, all of a sudden I was, I was, he was standing over me, looking down, talking to me, and spitting in my face. And I took and I wiped. I said, what are you doing? I said, why are you always doing this to me? And so after I, um, after I wiped that off, I got ready to stand up because he was hitting me again. That's when I tried to grab him. I tried to grab him to bring him to me, and that's when he took and punched me in my stomach. I mean, there was like five or six of us there trying to hold him. He was wild. He was all over the place, throwing blows at people. They was ducking. They, they couldn't hold him. So when the police came, I said, arrest him. I arrest him. I said, he just attacked me. I was in hysterics. Um, the guy says, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, he's your boyfriend. I said, my boyfriend? I said, what that has to do with it? I said, the man just attacked me. I said, what do they have to do with it? Um, well, we didn't see anything. They didn't see anything. They're the police. 
And in the meantime, Alfred was standing back there, jumping around, laughing, and just laughing. It was a big joke to him. I couldn't believe what was happening. I was so embarrassed. I was so ashamed. This was on my job. I'd been on the streets before when people intervened, but this was on a job. You know, I didn't know whether I was going to get fired or what. One time I had a restraining order against him, and he was living with his mother. But he would be at my house all the time for hours trying to get in the door. And uh, it was... It was in the middle of summer and I was hammering the windows closed and he told me that um, I had called the police for them to come and they never came. It was one of those times because they just got real used to me calling and they never bothered coming anymore. And um, so instead of not coming, I just was hammering my window closed because I was afraid Tommy was going to come in the door. And then he did, he busted through the door. He came through, took the hammer off the table because I ran and he started hitting me with it and um, there was some teeth knocked out I was hit in the back I was hit in the I don't really remember where I was hit there was just blood everywhere and um, his friend was there and I'm lucky that his friend was there because if he wasn't I he would have killed me that night there was no doubt in my mind I would not be here October 26 Bernadette, 29, of Medford, died after being stabbed in the back six times and beaten on the head. He came upstairs and me and him started tussling and arguing and stuff and I told him, I said, just let me pack my stuff, I'm going to leave and I won't come back. And he told me, he said, bitch, before you leave, I'll kill you. Anytime he told me that he was going to kill me, I believed him to a certain extent, but this night, it was more fearful than ever. You know, the expression on his face was like a real cold expression, you know. And um, he had threatened to kill me, so he went downstairs and came back upstairs with a 357 Magnum that was his. And he had um, threatened me with the gun, and I was laying on the bed you know, crying and everything, and then he put the gun in the drawer. He walked out the room, went back down the stairs, I took the gun out, and I placed it under the bed. My intentions was just to keep the gun from him. Well, when he came back upstairs, we started tussling and fighting, and I pulled the gun out and I shot him. And with the first shot that I shot him with, he said to me, bitch, you shot me in my head, I'm gonna kill you. And I met these guys um, at work, and they would see Tommy come in and terrorize me, and they'd say, well, you want us, you know, playing macho man, you want us to take care of this for you? You want us, you know? And I'd be like, yeah, you can just tell him to leave me alone if you want, you know? He was at work. Um, I went and got him from work and um, brought him in the car. My son was home. Two guys were with me. I lured him to a place. He thought that he was going to have his way with me and have sex, and he, that wasn't going to happen. But I left him and I lured him to the woods. The other guys were there. I brought him to the woods. I turned around. The guy swung the bat. And when, when he come up, jumped out of the woods, I ran back to the car. And um, they came back to the car, and they. One of the guys said that, uh, Why did you keep hitting him? And uh, the other guy said, I don't know, I just did. Um, he, he didn't care. The only thing he cared about and told me about from January of 85 into June of 85 was that he was going to kill me. 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 The only thing I can envision was um, him and his 007 knife. It's a um, street name for a big butcher knife like a uh, switchblade that he carried. I know he carried it and I know that um, he felt that I had hurt him and that he wanted me to be hurting back like him. When I had left Forest Hill Station, I went home and I watched the video and I said, no, I'm going to leave. And on my way out the door, I went into the kitchen and I picked up a knife out of my kitchen drawer and I put it in my pocket. When I went to the store and come out the store, I, um, I took and didn't realize anybody was around there that I knew. I knew I wouldn't know anyone. So I took and opened up my door, the back seat, and I took and put the umbrella in and laid it on the floor. It was wet and I put the, bag on the um, back seat of my car. 
um, and I felt my, half of my body was in the car, and I felt Alfred, um, it, which was Alfred, hit me on the bottom part of my back. And I looked, I said, Lord, he don't, he don't found me. I turned around, I backed up out of the car, and that's when I turned around and I saw him. He said, uh-huh, bitch. He said, I don't caught you. He said, you didn't think I know where you'll be at, huh? I know everywhere you're going to be, bitch. I'm going to kill you. And next thing I remember, it happened in two seconds. He hit me. I hit him back. My, my next hand went to reach for my pocket. I took the knife out. I know now that, which I had blocked it out, that I stabbed him twice, they say, in his chest. Brian somehow got a court order, another judge, to say that he could take Timmy to Florida for 30 days. Um, Brian told me that I'd never see Timmy again. He told me he'd kill me if I didn't give him to me. I, I was afraid for my life and for Tim's life. Brian showed up early. He came up the steps and he was laughing. And um, he said, you better kiss Tim goodbye because you're never going to see him again. And I went into the house and I just started freaking out. I didn't know what to do. I know if I came back outside and told him, no, Tim's not here, you're not getting him, that he would kill me. I knew he was going to kill me that day. I mean, he had told me so. He was, it was like the final frontier. This was it. There was nowhere else for it to go. It was me or him. And um, my father was a policeman. He had guns in the house all my life. And I never thought ever of using any of those guns at any time except now I, I knew my life was on the line here so uh, I went in the house and I grabbed uh, I went in the cabinet and I grabbed my father's gun because I didn't know what else to do I had called the police I had done everything in my power to leave this man and to get the police to help me and they wouldn't so I had to protect myself. It was me or him. I guess I didn't know if I even wanted to live up until that moment, whether I should kill myself. I, I didn't know. So I grabbed the gun and I went out on the porch. And uh, he just stood there. And he looked at me and I shot the gun. And um, he came after me. He like stepped back and then stepped forward and I was pinned up against the screen door and um, he was trying to grab the gun out of my hand so I shot him again. It was horrible. I mean, I felt his life go right through mine. It was like time was standing still for that moment and nothing was going to change what was going to happen. It was like fate or something. The very DA's offices who somehow do not have the time, money, resources, people to help battered women when we come in as the plaintiffs in these actions or as witnesses in criminal cases, somehow have all the prosecutors, all the police investigators they can possibly need when we are the defendants. The battered women who kill are mistreated at every juncture in the criminal justice system. They have higher initial bail set. They are detained longer and ultimately have higher sentences than any other kind of defendant, including serial rapists and murderers. This is nothing short of misogyny. This is nothing short of a criminal justice system that is dealing very differently with women as defendants and in particular battered women as defendants than any other kind of defendant. My trial was for February the 3rd to the 6th, I believe. I think I had four days of trial. My attorney, um, he produced the battered women's syndrome, um, but they wouldn't allow it to um, be a, in, into, the, into the courtroom. I was charged with second degree murder and was given a life sentence at 27 years old. I pled guilty to manslaughter and got an 18 to 20 year sentence. Which I'm serving now. I've served three and a half years of it. Um, Brian's parents ended up with my son, even though my family raised him for seven years of his life. I was arrested for a first degree murder. And then I went to ATU, awaiting trial. 
And I spent three and a half years up there in that one hallway, in that one room. I was locked 22 hours a day awaiting trial. I spent many hours crying, wondering what's going to happen to me facing life in prison. And um, I don't know how I did those three and a half years up there. I mean, it was a prisoner war camp, so to speak, locked up in this 8 by 15 room. But my life, it was, I wasn't afraid anymore either. I wasn't afraid of dying. The new Tony wasn't going to kill me. And uh, they, I went to trial three years later, and uh, they gave me 15 to 20 years for manslaughter. I've been tortured all my life, but being with Jose was the worst. And I just couldn't take any more. And here I sit in prison seven, eight to 15 years. I'm the victim. I've been victimized by Jose, and now I'm being victimized by the system. If you have not been victimized, if you have not been stalked, if you haven't been stabbed, beaten, chased across state lines, tracked down, kidnapped, taken back, beaten again, feared for your life, you have truly been blessed. And this is an opportunity to thank God that you have been spared that. But I would argue it means you have a greater responsibility to try to empathize and understand with those of us who live with that who don't know what it is to sleep through an entire night because you jump at every noise. Yes, 15 years later. I just hope that no other woman has to defend her life like I had to. If anybody learns anything from me telling my story, I hope it's, it's that, that you do have rights and demand them because they have to protect you. The police should have protected me, the courts should have protected me, and they didn't, and here I sit. And it shouldn't have to happen to anybody else. If a stranger had been doing this to me, they would have helped me. But because it was my husband and my ex-husband, they won't help me. And I don't understand it. I don't understand. I didn't murder no one. He came to murder me. It just so happened I put the final blow to him instead of him putting the final blow to me. The whole situation with this, it didn't have to be. There didn't have to be a death, there didn't have to be me in prison. And I didn't have, and my son didn't have to lose his mother for how many years, and he doesn't know me anymore. It didn't have to be this way. But I'm grateful to be alive. I thank God for letting me sit here and tell my story. Again, October 26, Angeline, 55 years old, was shot to death. And Kathleen, on November 11th, 35, and her son, Marcus, 8, were strangled to death and stuffed in a closet. 20 women in 11 months. It's crazy. I could have been one of these statistics. But I fought back. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. No one shall be subjected to torture, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. 
These articles are from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the United Nations in 1948.